Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a return guest for you this week, Kevin J. Anderson. He was on the show about a year ago, and he's been up to quite a bit since then. Uh, for those that don't know, he's a New York Times bestselling science fiction and fantasy author. And he's been super busy at conventions as a guest speaker this week, and uh, not this week, this year, selling books for his Wordfire Press. And uh, he also spent a year to get his MFA so he could be a professor of grad students at Western State Colorado University in Gunnison, where he is now the director of the Certificate in Publishing program and teaches about indie and traditional publishing. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the show. Uh, did I mangle anything too much there, or does that sound right? <laughs> uh, that, that sounds familiar to me. I think it's pretty close. So good to be back on. Well, it sounds like you've had a pretty busy year. Do you want to catch us up on what you've been doing since we talked to you last summer? Well, we should probably tell people that that there's a bit of a lag because I'm up in this uh, I'm up in a mountain cabin where I go to hide and and get some editing done when I have you know I have to do real writing as well as all this business stuff. Uh, but the problem is that there is an internet connection, so I spent most of the afternoon answering emails and things instead of getting much editing done. But um, I've just a little bit of background. I mean, I've published over 150 books. Uh, 56 of them have been national or international bestsellers, and I've written um, for almost every major traditional publisher, from Bantam and HarperCollins and Simon and Schuster and Pocket and Tor Books. And and uh, about 2010, I uh, started my own press, Wordfire Press, with uh, my wife Rebecca Mesta. And we started publishing my own backlist, but that sort of took off on us. And, and we did a count about a week ago, and we published 285 titles from 124 different authors. So um, not just traditionally published, although um, your people are going to cringe, but I loved it back in the 90s when they just threw big advances on me and then they did all the work. But, you know, I can whine about it or I can try to survive in the new the new world. So I'm I'm kind of a... A solid hybrid writer. I, I've got um, doing tons of promotion and keeping myself exhausted with newsletters and podcasts and and all my social media stuff and publishing books and writing books. I still have right now. I think I've got four major books under contract with traditional publishers, but um, I'm also releasing about six of my own books through Wordfire Press through the the indie channels, and so I'm kind of and I just became a professor, so I'm teaching grad students about publishing and writing. So um, that's why I need to run off into the mountains to get a little peace and quiet for a bit. Yeah, you, you don't sound very busy. I mean, you're kind of slacking off over there. Uh, it's, it sounds like with your experience. Well, it would be okay. different. Go ahead. Sorry, say, there's our leg. It would be different if they just sort of, yeah. It would be different if they just, uh, like, gave me lots of money to write one book a year. But since that doesn't happen, um, I can either eat ramen noodles and live in a house trailer, or I can try to do a lot of other things and, and uh, keep, buying, keep buying bonbons for my, my wife, who's also a best-selling author, and she's also helping me uh, run the press. So, um, but I, I mean, the thing is, I love doing all of this stuff. I mean, I've, I wanted to be a writer since I was five, and everything about me um, all my, my high school, my college, my, my jobs, everything was sort of focused on being able to become a writer. And now there's just a whole lot more work in different directions and it keeps changing. I, I feel like, um, all of us indie authors and traditional authors that we're, we're just running faster and faster on the gerbil wheel and wondering why it's not going anywhere. But, but the gerbil wheel changes every week too. So that's another problem. It actually seems like with all your experience, you're just the perfect t person to teach. How did you get involved in that? What made you decide to jump into that? Um, being a freelance writer has no health care, and a university professor does. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's, that's not all of it. That, that's, that's clearly an important thing. But I've, I've done a great deal of teaching over the years. I, I run the Superstars Writing Seminar with Rebecca, and we're, we're approaching our 10th year right now, which is, uh, we get about 150 students, and that's 
uh, very ambitious in, in all kinds of aspects of the publishing business rather than just, just craft. So I've been doing that. Uh, I've been teaching uh, with, with Christine Catherine Rush and Dean Wesley Smith on a lot of different workshops and, and giving tons of seminars at, at conventions. So I've, I've always liked teaching, but um, it was kind of a shock to me that the, the college student programs in English and writing and publishing are, um, let's just say they're a little bit in an academic bubble and they don't really have any real contact with reality. And so when I started um, talking to some other people who teach these programs, uh, I found people that were really on the same wavelength as I am. And we, well, there's, there's a group, it's Western State Colorado University, and they have an actual MFA program in genre fiction. It's two years long, and it's very intensive, and it's very useful on writing romance and thrillers and westerns and science fiction and fantasy. These aren't your um, artsy-fartsy, uh, get a degree because you could do a free verse poem somewhere. These are real nuts and bolts, two years of trying to learn how to be a genre fiction person. And they had a to teach it. And when I started talking with them and they, um, the people running the program uh, for genre fiction realized that I have, I mean, I spent 13 years as a technical writer doing nonfiction uh, book design and printing for the, for the Department of Energy. And I worked for the Air Force doing brochures for their laser weapons systems and stuff. And I've now uh, been about eight years running my own uh, indie press. Of course, I, I don't know, you can call it an indie press with almost 300 titles published, but uh, I still feel like that's where I'm coming from. So I had all this background, and I just wanted to be able to teach people the real stuff. I mean, this, this is what it really is going on rather than um, somebody teaching you how to submit to a literary journal where you have to pay 50 bucks for them to read your submission. And I didn't make that up, by the way. That really happened. So we don't want people to do that. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was looking at classes in school, I wanted to take creative writing, but you'd get like somebody that, like you were saying, only has a poem published or a book of poetry in like a university press. And if you want to, you know, publish fantasy and science fiction, that's maybe not where <laughs> the emphasis that you're interested in. So one of the other things that I... I ran into is I just had, I had a bachelor's degree with honors and then I, I got a job right out of college and I worked there for you know 15 years and I worked as a freelancer for 30 years. And so now I'm going back to try to teach grad school writing and publishing. And even with 150 books published and I'm running my own press, I wasn't qualified to teach creative writing because I didn't have an MFA. So I had to go back to school and spend a year getting my own MFA. So here I am workshopping short stories with other students who were in their first year at 22 years old or something. Um, kind of an interesting experience. I could see where that might be a little hard on the ego, especially if you got some criticism that maybe you're like, what? That's not fair. <laughs> well, I mean, I, it was, when I was program and create it that way think of it as you're spending your time to teach and so that's basically what I did these were hoops that I had to jump through and and uh, now I know about Freudian Freudian analysis and Marxist analysis of short fiction in the early 20th century and um, for all the all the good that that does me great stuff every Every single day, I'm sure. But uh, I'm looking, I mean, I just spent two weeks in Gunnison, which is a beautiful college in Southern Colorado. Uh, we do two and a half, you know, two weeks of sort of intensive on-site face-to-face -face with the students. And then the whole rest of the year is online. And then they come back for um, two more weeks in the summer for to wrap things up. So um, I'm very happy with it, and I'm just kind of starting out. So um, that's yet another thing that I get to, to keep me busy with. 
Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, moving on to some of the other things you've been up to in this last year, um, you were actually publishing an epic fantasy novel to your newsletter the last time we talked to you. I'm curious if you found uh, that ended up being a good marketing tool. Did a bunch of people go out and buy it afterwards? Or how was that experience overall? So I was writing this big epic fantasy novel called Spine of the Dragon, which I, I sold to Tor Books. It'll be a you know, big hardcover doorstop thing. And as I was writing it, um, you know, I always have a, a group of test readers on my manuscripts, but I thought there are a lot of fans that are, they don't want to wait two years to read the book. And so I basically set up a, a subscription thing. I guess it's almost like Patreon, only I wasn't thinking of modeling that. So they subscribed to it, and I, I just uploaded the draft chapters to them as I finished them every day. And um, in fact, a lot of people might know, I do most of my writing with a digital recorder. So I go out hiking and I dictate uh, one chapter after another when I'm out in the mountains. And, and so they, I had it that they could just, um, they could get the chapters as they came back from the typist and read the word files. Or for like the VIP level, I just sent them my audio files every day. So it was like Kevin Anderson dictating a, a brand new chapter to them every single day and they got to hear me create the book from the very beginning. And our, our, our thing was you witness the birth of a novel is what it was like. But I, I outline all my chapters. And so I was, um, you know, two chapters a day, every day. And I wrote this, um, 200,000 word book in about 40, 50 days. And the people who subscribed to it just got to hear two or three chapters every single day as I was doing it. And they gave me feedback as it, as it was coming in. And that was, that was really pretty cool. I mean, I, I got, uh, I mean, a bunch of subscribers, not, not thousands, but I got a handful enough to certainly uh, raise a little bit of money and, and uh, it generated some interest in the book and they're talking about it. But remember, this is traditional publishing. So that was a year ago when we talked about it and the book is now scheduled for June of 2019. So it's still a year off before it even, it even gets published. So that's why the people that wanted to subscribe to it because they've now read it a year ago and now they're nagging me for the second one and I haven't even published the first one yet. It's funny how often that's the case where like it, the, the pipeline gets so long that by the time you need to actually, you know, pitch something and promote something, it's completely out of your head and you're five yeah. books later. Or more. I mean, they, in fact, just, just today I have a brand new book that we released Wordfire. It's a, uh, I've spent about a year, doing all the hard work of putting together all of my short fiction. I've got about 130 stories that have been published over the years. And I've got a four volume uh, collection of my short fiction. And the, the very first one just came out uh, today. It's called Selected Stories um, Science Fiction Volume 1. So I, I've got a science fiction one and the next month I'll have a collection of my fantasy stories. Year after, or the month after that it'll be um, horror and dark fantasy stories, and then following that with a second volume of science fiction stories. So we put that together, and I'm I'm releasing it in ebook and trade paperback and hardcover all at the same time because different readers want different formats. But boy, was that a, a pain in the butt! Just I mean, some of these are 30, 40 year old stories to find the original copies and and the copyright information and just. Um, that was a real pain. And of course, then I wrote a little introduction for each story so that here's the inspiration for something or, or here's what I was thinking of. Because I'm, as a reader, I want to get that personal thing from the author. I don't want, just want a book full of short stories. So that one just came out today as we're recording this. So it's a selected stories, science fiction. And I've got, well, let me back up because we did 2016, I really pulled out the pull out the stops. I think that was when I was last time I talked to you guys. I was going full tilt doing uh, comic cons and science fiction conventions. I did 22 convention appearances in in that one year, and we went to Denver Comic Con and Dallas Comic Con and and New York Comic Con and Chicago C2E2 and and con after con and we had this giant booth and we sold books and, and we sold a lot of books, not, not just by me, but we had uh, guest authors. We had Jim Butcher and Brandon Sanderson and Christopher Paulini and, and uh, Jody Lynn Nye and Todd McCaffrey and all kinds of other authors. And we would just set up our, our stand and have all of our books there. 
we autographed a lot and and it was just a full time circus of of driving the van around the country and having a warehouse and ordering all these books and and uh it was a huge success and we went twenty two shows and I added up we were seen by 1.5 million people. And these are actual fans that go to these cons. So it wasn't just like a Barnes and Noble where you don't know who's going to walk in. These were self-identified fans. And we just saw 1.5 million people. And I didn't get hardly any writing done that whole damn year. <laughs> and so we, we spent all that time and got all that attention. And I kind of got cold feet in, in 2017 when I realized that 2017 – looked like it was going to be the first year since 1988 that I wasn't going to have a new Kevin J. Anderson book out. And I went, that's, that's not what I'm about. I'm supposed to be writing. So I wrote like crazy and I published two books of mine through Wordfire and got them out by the end of the year. And then this year I've been just writing like crazy. I have a brand, at least one new book out every single month from May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, and January. So I'm kind of in the middle of this this forced march of releasing books. They're all my short story collections, and I'm doing a um, some new Dan Shamble stuff, and I've got a, a new alternate history novel that came out in hardcover from Bain a couple of months ago. Um, it just finally I'm back to pushing all the books out, and so now I need to turn around and start promoting all these things so I don't release the books just into the wild and let them survive on their own. That's the hard part. Yeah, and that that brings me to to a uh, uh, question I wanted to ask. Uh, there's a lot of schools of thought when it comes to contacting your fans via your mailing list or whatever. A lot of authors prefer to just keep it to new releases because we feel like we're bothering our fans otherwise. It seems like you're a lot you're interested in in engagement with your fans. So, like, do you feel like keeping your fans engaged pays off? Well, in fact, the the new releases are. I don't think my fans want to get an advertisement. They, they want to get a connection with, with me and find me. In fact, we just, I'll go out tomorrow, but I just put together the, uh, a newsletter to, or uh, whatever you call it that goes out to our, our readers group. And yes, I mentioned the new selected stories, the science fiction volume, which just got released. But the lead story is I was just at Tampa Bay Comic Con last weekend. So I got, I told about, what I did there and I did some pictures of our booth and the fans. Um, and then I talked about the new book and then I talked about, um, just last weekend, I led a group of 12 fans of the rock band rush on a mountain climb up a 14,000 foot peak. And so we all climbed this eight mile, uh, 4,000 foot elevation over rocks. And I, I sent pictures of that and sent pictures of the mountain goats and, and pictures of us standing on the, the summit and, and uh, then the next thing I was um, uh, mentioning, I'm going to be at Michigan, Michigan Comic Con in Detroit this coming weekend. And so that's where I was going to be. Um, and then we posted, a, actually not in this newsletter, but I had a free audio version of one of my stories. We posted a link to that. Um, I, I want them to not just go, here's an ad for Kevin's new book, because they don't want that. I hope that make them interested in being my fans and if they're my fans, then they're going to pick up the book. And if, if all you do is go buy my book, 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 you're just going to get followers dropping off really fast. You, you need to be a, an interesting person, which means don't make it up. I mean, do interesting things. Uh, volunteer for something or, or go on a trip or, or take ballroom dancing classes or whatever so that you're – your fans see you as a person and the interesting things that you do. And then the, they stick around and, you know, they might not always buy everything, but they'll certainly follow it. And the interaction that you get um, at least makes you think that somebody's paying attention. My question for you is regarding mailing lists. We've heard from several people that including some typographic that the person wants to see. So, you know, like whenever you get those emails, all those security programs kick in. We have blocked content because it could be dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Click here to allow the stuff. I mean, we're trying to find, I'm just trying to figure out how people are, are able to track how many times you know, that their emails are open, you know, because the tracking isn't always the greatest. Do you do something similar when you try and keep an, at least try and figure out how many people open your emails on your subscriber list? Um, well, it goes out through MailChimp and they tell you how many times it gets opened. I don't know if it's accurate 
or not, but that's that's really the best that that I track it with. I mean, if if those numbers aren't, I mean, if we'll send out, uh, what do I have? I think I have something like seven thousand people on my my readers group mailing list, and we'll get something like a twenty five thirty percent open rate is what which I think is pretty good. Um, doesn't mean that they will buy the book that I'm talking about, but at least they opened it and, and they read it. Um, I mean, that's, that's all you can ask. I mean, I can't track them down because they didn't open my email and yell at them because why are they still on my list if they're not opening the email? Um, it's, see, the, the problem is these days there is no, like, surefire thing. You just have to do everything and hope that 1% of the time it works. I hope 1% of the time it works. You mentioned that uh, when you went to these conventions, you actually had a lot of su success and sold a lot of books and connected with the fans, but then you had to retreat to your writing hole, which I completely understand. <laughs> Just the thought about those conventions sounds super stressful. Is there a balance, do you think, like in the future, will you maybe do three or four a year, or what should a writer who is kind of interested in doing that stuff think of doing it as far as finding balance between that and writing new books? Well, I mean, I, I'm pretty rigid on when I'm not at the booth or when I'm not on a panel, I run back to my room and I try to get editing or writing done. Um, people might think it's glamorous of, oh boy, you get to go to, go to Detroit next week and, or I was just in Tampa or I just was in um, uh, Houston or something. Um, what I see are the convention centers in my hotel room. I don't spend time sightseeing, which I think sounds kind of sad, but uh, this is my, my work day, and, and I have noise-canceling headphones when I'm on the airplane, so I don't hear the screaming baby in the seat behind me. Um, I, I have to learn how to get writing done, even in sort of disruptive situations. And yeah, I'm not going to do 22 a year again, but um, I'll, I'll do maybe six to 10 this year just because um, I, I want to stay in front of the people so that people know that I'm still writing and still doing new things. And yet, like with my background, the bulk of my fans are, they come up that they read my star Wars books in the nineties. And, and that's great. I love the people that, that read my star Wars books. And my job is to try to get them to read the stuff I'm writing now. And some of them don't cause all they want to do is read star Wars books and that's fine. But if I can, meet them and shake their hand and sign their book and get my picture taken with them and say, Hey, you might really like this selected stories book that just came out or my Dan Shamble zombie PI book that um, I've got a series of. If, if you can, if you can hook just even a fraction of them, whether it's 10% or even 5%, then those are readers that I wouldn't have otherwise. And, and, and frankly, some of these stories that I get from the fans that come up, um, that uh, you know, one, one guy was going to kill himself and he, he had a, a very bad physical deformity and he was going to kill himself. And he wrote me a letter saying that he decided not to, he wanted to stay alive and keep reading my books. And I, I meet people who are um, army vets who, who um, they're finishing reading a book the night that uh, some of their buddies got killed. And, and just they come up and, and they explain their, uh, their experiences. And I mean, I, I can't match any of that stuff. I'm just making up planets and starships and, and, and blowing up characters. And I, just to get this firsthand reaction from readers and how my book affected them at a certain time, uh, it, it, you can't get that from not going out and meeting people. So um, I, I try to have the personal contact as much as I can. Um, but again, you don't want to be the guy who promotes all the time and talks about the book he published seven years ago because he hasn't written anything since. Uh, I, I got to balance getting my writing done and getting books out um, with selling them. And on the flip side, if you don't sell any of them, then you don't really make a living by writing either. So it, it is a big balance. It seems like, especially when you have so many books out, and I assume now that you've cut and got the rights back and you're publishing them as eBooks, that you actually can make money from books you published 20 years ago. So do you, are you kind of struggling too with balancing how much time do I spend like trying to promote my backlist stuff and maybe how much time getting new stuff out there? Cause I feel like I'm gonna be in your shoes one day. I'm <laughs> pretty prolific. So I could see getting to the point where I have 150 right. books out there. 
Well, I mean, you, you promote the front list, but because you're an indie author, you can keep selling the old stuff. I mean, people are still buying my first Dan Chamble book, even though I've got six of them out now, and they, you hope that it keeps, it keeps building. But um, back in traditional publishing, your, your book like came and went, and then it was out of print in a year. And that doesn't happen anymore. And for, in fact, now you like wish things would go out of print faster so you get the rights back to them. Um, that's the thing that is completely different with, with indie publishing is, you know, if I'm selling five copies a month, every month for five years, that's a lot of copies. I'm still happy with that. Plus you keep all the money instead of giving 85% of it away. So that, that helps. And, you know, you, it, you never know which, which raindrop is going to hit the fan at the right time. I mean, you, you have a lot of books. Somebody might catch this short story. Somebody might catch a, this podcast. Somebody might meet me at a convention. Somebody might find one of my books in a used bookstore. Somebody might recommend it. it it's, it's like a drip, drip, drip thing. You never know what's going to work. So you have to do everything and hope that enough of it works that, that you can buy enough macaroni and cheese to live on. Yeah, and that's that sort of like brings me to to the question I have about uh, when you're doing all these conventions. It seems like there's a, a lot of like algebra that goes into determining whether a convention trip is worth it, because I mean, there's the actual like money that you would make from the convention versus the the money it costs to attend to the convention. If you're not a, a a guest of honor, then you're paying to go to the convention, uh, and then there's the lost writing time. So like, how do you measure the success of a convention? Well, and I'm, I will be kind of blunt because of my, who I am as an author, I do get invited as the, the guest of the con. So they'll at least pick up my, my plane ticket in my hotel room. So because they, they have me on panels and I give, give lots of talks. So that part isn't really a factor for me. But on the other hand, if I'm giving up four days and getting not nearly as much writing done, well, what do I get out of it? Well, I, I do hope that I get a lot of fans because it's our own table that I'm selling my own books. So I'm getting the bookseller profit of it, not just the, the 10% royalties that you get from a, like a traditionally published book. Um, I'm meeting more fans. I'm getting names for my, my newsletter, um, uh, the readers group. I'm, I'm getting people to sign up to the Facebook page and the Twitter feed. And um, you know, it, it, there is no accurate measurement. I mean, you just have to feel yourself. Is this something that you like to do? Is this something that you feel is, is beneficial to your career? Now there, you know, you might argue I'm, I'm a new indie author and I've only got um, two books out and nobody knows who I am. Well, I just had one of our, uh, our superstars writing seminar graduates was also at uh, Tampa Bay comic con and he had, uh, he had his own table on Author's Alley, and he had his own um, you know, retractable banners and stuff. And he shipped in 60 copies of his book, and he sold all 60 of them by Saturday afternoon um, so he could pack up and not even go the, the next day if he didn't want to. But that's 60 books. I'm, I'm doing the numbers in the top of my head. 60 books he sold for 15 bucks. I think they cost him um, – four bucks each. So what's that? $11 profit on each one. So that's 660 bucks he made from selling his books. Um, I don't know if he got a cheap plane ticket or, or what his hotel room was. Um, 660 bucks is probably more than more than he spent to get there. Plus he sold his books. He got new readers. He got a hundred new names for his uh, newsletter um, and I think he got to see his girlfriend in Tampa. So it all, that's probably the defining factor there. Um, but go if you, if you like to, and, uh, then you'll start making connections too. that. Uh, I'm sure he met, I know he met other indie authors Then he's maybe joined some, some of their support groups and, and, uh, uh, some of their mailing lists so that they can help each other out. And you guys know that, that everything about this is all networking and, and uh, everybody helping each other out rather than being you know, ruthless and independent. And if you're a new author, just meeting other authors at your level um, really helps. I mean, I've mentioned earlier that I teach with Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush. They, they're both 
huge giants in both the indie field and professional. Chris has won like every award in the genre and she was editor of fantasy and science fiction and she's published, I don't know, 50, 60 traditionally published books and she's a best-selling author. And Dean is similar. I think he's got 500 different books that are out. We all met when we were brand new authors with only one short story sale among us. So we've known each other for 40 some years and we've, we've, helped each other through the whole time, just passing on information or, um, hey, did you know this anthology is open or this editor just ripped somebody off or um, here's how you can um, promote for certain award or something like that. You can listen to me talk to somebody else or try to teach them, but you learn the most from your own peers. And if you, if you have your own group of writers that are about your level of experience, then you'll get a lot of information from them because you're all sort of discovering things at the same time. And by meeting people at these conventions, you'll get a lot of advice that you wouldn't otherwise get. So that's another thing. And, you know, depends on where you're going. So Tampa's great. And, and um, I haven't been to Detroit in probably 15 years. And um, I go to New Orleans or San Diego or San Francisco or places that I like to go to. And if you're, if you're an author and you never travel anywhere, you're going to have a hard time describing things you've never seen. So that helps you as a writer, too, just to meet different people and go different places. Very, very true. My question for you with regards to the conventions and whatnot, I mean, I've, I've spoken with several authors who feel it's better when you attend these conventions, attend them together. Therefore, you can try and split up the cost of the table and the booth and everything. So my question is, what advice would you give to an author who is planning on attending a convention for the first time? Um, bathe, brush your teeth. Um, well, there are, there are like convention etiquette things. And in fact, Wordfire published a book called Pros and Cons by uh, Jody Lynn Nye and Bill Fawcett. It's a whole book full of basically their advice for convention etiquette and how to, how to behave. Uh, I do very strongly agree on sort of the team effort. If you can get um, more than one author to go together on, I mean, even if it's two authors and two tables, you're like a united front. And it's a lot easier if you have another author saying, look how great Kevin's book is, rather than Kevin saying, look how great my book is. And if you can help each other out, I think that, uh, and it gives you more diversity. If you have five different authors and five or more different books, then if somebody walks up and you've written a big space opera, science fiction epic, but the person really just reads vampire urban fantasy, well, then you point them to one of the other authors at the table and you can, you can satisfy them rather than only giving them the one thing. Um, if you are never been to a convention uh, before, uh, you know, I, I really love these pop culture conventions, the comic cons, which are springing up in just about every major city. It used to be that science fiction conventions were much smaller affairs. They're like little couple hundred, um, attendees and they were in a hotel with a handful of panels and a couple of author guests. That's a whole different type of convention. Um, they'll say it's more reader oriented, but I still think there's more readers at a 30,000 person convention than there are at a 300 person convention. And just the energy of the, the fans and the cosplayers and the movie fans and the, the, the TV actors and, and uh, the gaming professionals and anime voices, it just all fills, fills the attendees with energy. And I, I just like being part of that. And so if you're gonna go, maybe you wanna, maybe you just wanna do it as a stealth thing first to just be an attendee and wander around. And, and talk to, if, if you're an indie author, every one of these conventions has the equivalent of an author's alley. And you can just be stealthy and spy and look at the different authors and see Who's, who's got a line of people there and who doesn't, what their, their banners are like, what their tablecloths are like, what are they doing, uh, what does their book cover look like. And man, I've seen, I mean, you've done this too. You walk into like a convention dealer's room and, and it's full of indie authors. And some of them, you know how like the, the Medusa was so ugly you turned to stone if you looked at her? Well, some of these book covers are like that. They're so ugly you look at them and go, ooh, I would be ashamed to even put this on a table. And they don't know it. But you walk through and you can really tell who the professionals are and who they aren't. And you can watch how they interact with their fans. Look at their, uh, are, they, are they collecting names? How are they collecting names? 
Um, are they giving out candy or are they giving out bookmarks? And, and just, just sort of hang back and look at who's got the attention and who does it and try to figure out what it is that they're, that they're doing right. I do this myself because I see, um, you know, some of the very successful in the authors, they'll, they'll blow through a mountain of books on their little table. And I want to make sure that, that I'm picking up on what I can pick up and, and um, hope that that happens. Yeah, I imagine the book covers, it's always important, but it's got to be super important and at these conventions to, you know, just have that really cool spaceship or dragon on there that's uh, almost going to sell the book before somebody even picks it up. Yeah, and, and just in case people don't know this, a cover that's full of all cap old English letters does not work. Don't do that. And just because you own 500 fonts doesn't mean you have to put them all on your cover. A bit of graphic design advice there. Yeah, I think when we do it ourselves, we don't realize that there's certain fonts that are kind of the standard in the industry and stuff looks a little weird if you're being creative and just doing your own thing. Yeah, well, that, I, I mean, I've got a big background in graphic design and I've worked in book design for a long time. I don't do my own covers. I have a designer that I absolutely adore and she and I work very closely together and she is way better than I am. I can do it, but hers look better and I would rather she did it. Hire a professional. Always good advice. And uh, for the people listening that are like, well, I'm not doing conventions. I, I want to do my marketing online. Uh, I imagine with Wordfire Press, you have kind of all those backlist that are new, new, new releases, I guess, of old titles that you can tinker with. Is there anything you're finding? I'm, I'm sure you're trying Facebook and, and maybe BookBub and, and some of these things. What are you finding that you're really liking right now? Well, I mean, a lot of my main effort is just, I, I've got three Facebook pages and a Twitter account and, and a blog that I kind of let die because it doesn't get that many people reading it. Um, it's a bandwidth issue for me that, that I know a lot of things that I should be doing more book bubs and more Amazon ads and, and things like that. But really there's only so many hours in a day and that's the thing of mine that, that does kind of fall by the wayside. Um, I promote them where I can and Wordfire, we're, we're very upfront with the people when we take them on that, that we produce a really nice book and we know, and we can get them listed everywhere. We can do hardcovers and we're, we're part of the Bain books, ebook library, which has a big distribution and, and we can do all that stuff. But, but this is a team effort that if you're an author that says here, Kevin published my book, I'm just going to go and hide in the corner. Now that's not an author that we want. Uh, in fact, I had, um, we, what I like to do is to get authors that are, have their own fan base and that they're relatively well known and either they've got backlist titles that they want back in print or they've got something that didn't fit with their publisher. Um, those are the people that I like, but we did have somebody, uh, an author that, that I knew, uh, from the nineties, a person who had published like eight or nine books from Harper Collins and had done quite well and was nominated for a couple of awards and got some star reviews and was a, was a known person. She um, appeared in Locust magazine and everything. So this is somebody that, that I was familiar with and I got contacted uh, by her and she said that uh, she had been dropped from her publisher because they were cutting out the mid list and, and she had a new book and wanted to know if Wordfire was interested. And I was interested because she's a, uh, I mean, an author that I knew. I, I, I recognized the name right away, and I'd like to have uh, the author's name on our on our list of authors. And I thought, well, this is kind of cool. And I was, like, just going to jump on it because I, I know that the book was going to be well-written, a very well-experienced author with a, a good track record. And so then I did, you know, kind of like when you go on a blind date, you do a Google search and try to figure out who the, the, the background of this person is. And I found that this author doesn't have a blog, doesn't have a Twitter account, has a Facebook page with 65 friends on it, and the last posting was a month ago, and the posting said, crap, I have to go to the library tonight and talk about my book. I hate to do that. I'm never doing it again. And I thought, uh, no, this is not a person that we can put on our, on our list. I'm sure the book is wonderful, but if you can't do anything to sell the book, then 
I, I can't do anything with the book. I, I need to have an author who really can push the books. And because we're doing a lot of the heavy lifting as far as the, the design and the publication and, and getting the reviews and, and getting it in distribution systems and everything. But it doesn't exist in a vacuum. I need to have the author champion it, championing it too. Don't ever say that word in dialogue, championing. Yeah, it's tricky. There's a lot of, there's a lot of sentences I've put together that I don't envy my narrator for having to read. But um, uh, so I have a question about when you're, when you're pr preparing your own, and I can't talk either. When you're preparing your own novels, uh, like do you check what the, what the market looks like and try to plan your next and adjust your next novel to, to meet what the market demands? Or do you just sort of trust that you've got the following now that you don't need to do that anymore? Well, I, my, my writing schedule is so backed up and I've got the books that I'm, I'm planning to come out, like I said, whatever, one a month or more from May through January. Um, it's always been a really dangerous thing to, to say um, steampunk vampires are hot right now, so I'm going to write a steampunk vampire book and try to publish it. Um, that's usually a recipe for disaster. So I, I don't, but again, I'm, I'm a... I'm not your typical person because I have 23 million copies in print and I've got 150 books and I've got a big mailing list and I've already got a solid fan base. So if I, like I just published the selected stories thing, this is my collection of science fiction short stories. Well, I don't know if there's any market for that, but I'm pretty sure that I've got 500 to a thousand of my fans that'll buy it. And if these are all reprint stories anyway, so that's, my risk is very small. If I'm going to write a brand new novel, well, my, my big indie series is the Dan Shamble zombie PI books. And the first one is Death Warmed Over, and I've done Unnatural Acts and Hair Raising and Slimy Underbelly and Tastes Like Chicken and a collection called Working Stiff. Well, I just wrote Tastes Like Chicken last year, just completely on spec. I wrote it. Um, and then we published it. So that means that um, well, I married one of the best editors in the business, so I sort of get a, a pass when she edits that, so I don't have to pay for that. They have to pay for the cover painting and the cover design. Um, uh, we have a production editor who does our, our production. We always use vellum to get everything done, so that's, that's quick and easy. And so the book came out, and, and it's in three months, it's, it's sold a fair number of copies. I mean, I'm not Hugh Howie, but it's sold enough to have been worth writing. And it will keep selling because it's not like a traditional book. Um, I will keep whatever, a, a hundred copies a month or something. And then because it's now part of a series, we're looking at you know, dropping the price of book one and running a bunch of Amazon ads and connecting them all together. Uh, it, I know it's a good idea. I just you know, need to have the brain cells and the time to do all the stuff that I need to. And that's always the big question because what I'd really rather be doing is just, just writing. But you got to do it all. So what strategy would you recommend if an author is unable to release, let's just say, because everyone always says, you know, if you can release titles, multiple titles, one right after the other, that's a great way to build up fans and whatnot. But what happens if you don't write that quickly? I mean, what, what, what would you recommend doing? If it's say you only write maybe one book every four or five months or even one book a year, which that's how I originally started. Well, you know, this is so laughable because if you only write one book every four months, you're going to horrify the New York publishers because they'll tell me that, that you can only do one a year or so. That's, that's like a speedy writer. That, that's really what has, has transformed with the, the indie publishing is that they, we now know that readers want the next book quickly. They don't want to wait one or two years for the next one to come out. And so if you can bring it out faster, then, then you can. But here's one of the, the drawbacks of, of what you suggested. If you're bringing out three or four books in a row every month, bang, 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 that only works if you really spend all the effort promoting the crap out of it because you need to get the momentum from the first one to lead into the second one, to lead into the third one. And that's been the bane of my existence that um, I'm so busy writing that when they come out, it's, it's, uh, I'll post it on Facebook and Twitter and I'll put it in the readers group newsletter and, and do what I can. But um, I know some other indie writers that are like 70 hours a week that are just 
Um, they're like Steve Kornacki on election night looking at all the numbers of the different states that they, they're looking at which books sold where and in which format and what city bought it. And, and I, I wish I had another person who could spend all that time, but um, really and truly, I just have so much, have to count on the momentum that I have that will throw it out and I'll talk about it. And then I'll hope that enough people buy enough of the books that it cumulatively adds up to being worthwhile. If you're only writing, you said four months, so that's still three books a year. That's still enough. I mean, you, you bring out one and then you talk about it a lot. But I also, on my social media, I spend a lot of time talking about the books that I'm writing so that by the time it's released, my fan base has been hearing me talk about Tastes Like Chicken for eight months. And that's when it finally comes out. I've, I've spent eight months promoting the book before it even appears. And that, I think, is useful for them because they feel almost like they were, they were with you while you were pregnant, now the baby is born. And so it, it's, it, it helps you follow or have the followers come along. But, you know, there, there's a million things that you can do. You could spend all year and go to 22 conventions and be seen by a million and a half people which is great for a certain part, but then you run into the bubble after that, that you spend all your time doing that, and then you don't have a new book out. So you really do have to, have to balance it. And the real problem is, is the magic bullet, the thing that really works, that whether it's, it's BookBub or whether it's Amazon ads or, or whether it's your own readers group newsletter, the thing that was the super hit that did everything last year has been superseded by something else this year. And um, I mean, I, I was talked into getting an Instagram account because that was the big hot thing. Cause I've had Twitter and Facebook and blogs and everything else. And I'm delighted. I have thousands of followers on my Instagram. I couldn't tell you that a single one of them has ever bought a single one of my books because of a single Instagram post posting I ever did. But that's another ingredient of having the fans understand who you are as a person. Cause Instagram, I'm posting pictures of my hikes and the waterfalls and the, the chipmunk I saw on a rock or the summit of the 14,000 foot peak I just did. So it, there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation, but it helps build their, um, they feel a stake in you as an author and the book you're working on, especially if I'm, say I'm doing a, a, a canyon hike or a, a sand dunes hike or something, and I'll do pictures of it, and I will say, and I wrote chapter five in Spine of the Dragon while I did this hike. So it just it's that one little grain of sand that goes into uh, their thoughts, and, and what is it, marketing? You need seven impressions before people actually start paying attention, um, something like that. So So that all helps, but there is no... Here, here's my miracle solution. Do one thing and see what happens. I'm laughing because we had an Instagram pro on a couple weeks ago and I just started my first Instagram account. So we'll see if I can and manage to keep it going along with everything else. Well, I mean, does it make you happy to see that you've got 55 little hearts because they liked your picture and, and um, okay, good. And, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but um, I, I don't know that that's translating to book sales, but it doesn't always have to be about only book sales. I mean, I, I like building up dedicated fans and I like to know that they're going to be there um, and pick up my next book whenever they can. And, you know, maybe they can't afford it though. They'll get it at the library. Well, they're still a reader and they'll tell somebody that they liked it. And, and it, it's that all of the above thing. And I'm not going to cancel my Instagram account. I'm just, I'm just saying that I, I don't think that it's a, a, a rocket for making book sales, but it's yet another factor among the million other factors that keeps the gerbil wheel running in place as you keep spinning it and spinning it. Right. And there's some things that you may just as a person be more excited about, like if you're taking all these pictures of your hikes and, you know, I just got a new puppy. So I've been sharing pictures of the puppy in between. Oh, here's some character art and uh, stuff about the new book. So some of them are more fun for you and easier, I think, to do. And, and you know, like you're saying, they can help a little bit. You, know, you never know down the line who was watching well, or. The puppy is great. I mean, we've got 
I, I've got a, we got a new kit in Percival a year or two ago and I started doing pictures and of course he become hugely popular and they're all, they're all wanting pictures of Percival. And so I started a Facebook page for Percival Lowell Anderson and he's gotten on like 350 followers on, on Facebook. Um, and so of course then I do Percival's book club. I'll put the cat on top of my new book and put a picture on it and everybody likes that. And, and I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll post, this intensive writing advice, my, my secrets of the trade, really important things, and I'll get 20 people like it. And then I post a picture of the cat playing with the feather and they get 4,000 likes. And, um, but, oh well, they liked it. That's, that's what you do. Yeah, it, it's hard to beat animals uh, for <laughs> being purely entertaining and enjoyable. And well, you, know, you never know. <laughs> but this is, this is kind of a key though. And, and I said before, if you're trying to do promotion for your book, don't do promotion for your book. I mean, don't make all of your postings. Here's my book. Buy it. Here's a buy link. Here's my book. Here's my book. Post a review of my book. Um, Mark Lefebvre, who's, uh, or Mark Leslie is his writing name, uh, who's from Kobo that, that we all, uh, and Lindsay knows him and Joe knows him. Um, he carries around a skeleton in his car and he drives around with him and he's got pictures of himself with his skeleton. And the other thing that he does is he's a big microbrew fan. And as hi Mark, I've got an IPA right here. Um, every time he goes to a bar, he takes a picture of whatever beer he's drinking. And it's, he's got, it's like an app that lets him tag the beers that he's drinking and, and he gets followers from that. And so people are, are interested in that aspect of him and everybody who's interested in him because of his beer drinking um, is now at least peripherally interested in him as a writer because he's the writer that drinks the kind of beer that they like. Or, or Lindsay's the writer with the cute puppy or Kevin's the writer with the goofy cat. And um, whatever you need to do is going to help and, and add up. And uh, it's exhausting, but hey, if, if we were low energy people, we probably would have gotten a real job instead. Very true. I work a lot more now that I'm doing what I love than I did when I was uh, just making money before. <laughs> yeah, the, the, joke, the joke was that when you're self-employed, you only have to work half time and you get to choose which 12 hours of the day you work. <laughs> That sounds about right. Um, so we've been talking for a while. I wanted to go ahead and throw in a question from Twitter. This is from Andre. You've kind of been talking about this stuff, but what advice would you give to an indie writer on branding and how to find fans? Well, I mean, that, that's kind of what we were just talking about, that you don't just say, here I'm an author and here's my book, that you, um, I, I'm a board member of the the Challenger Learning Center for Space Science Education, and I do a lot of space stuff, and I help kids learn about space. Um, like I just I said earlier, I'm a professor teaching grad student stuff. I like to climb mountains. I've got a cute cat. Um, I, ha I own my publishing house. I go hiking all the time, and I send hiking pictures. You need to make yourself into an interesting person, um, and people will 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 gravitate to you from all these different directions. And at the core, it's you as the writer. Um, one bit of advice that I would really tell people to steer clear of is don't become a political ogre. I, I don't think you want to make your name by being a, a gun nut or an anti-gun nut or a Trump supporter or a Trump hater or, or whatever, that if that's if that's the way that you get your followers, you will lose as many followers who disagree with you as you gain that agree with you. And then it becomes this constant, I don't like to argue with people. So if it becomes a political thing, you're just arguing with people all the time. And I would, I would advise you to steer clear. I mean, unless that's what you want to do with the political cause, but don't grab onto a political cause because you think it'll get publicity for your book. Uh, that becomes the um, uh, the chain around your ankle that you can't get off. Um, start now. I mean, start your social media groups. Find find your friends. Find fellow colleagues, people with similar interests. Uh, start gathering names for your readers group or your newsletter. Uh, again, like I said, there's no one answer. Find out. But like what Lindsay said is important. If you don't like to go to cons, then don't go to cons. Uh, there's a lot of other things that you can do. I mean, almost uh, you go to any, if, if you can speak in public, 
libraries would love to have you talk about um, your writing process or your book, or there's, there are writing conferences, there are um, uh, lots of different things where you can just become, become somebody who's, who's on the, get on the radar is what you're trying to do. Um, but don't be obnoxious about it. I've also seen like these major writers conferences and like an indie author with one new book out just gets all indignant because she's not on 10 panels or, or doesn't get the same um, table placement as Jeffrey Deaver got or something like that. Remember that every, there's a lot of people who are in your position who have published one book or two books and you're all trying to figure it out um, and learn from one another. That's, that's how I learned everything, that there is no handbook that you can buy, although I'm, I'm sure somebody's published, indie published one on how to do it. Um, doesn't mean that it's right. Learn from other people and um, make your connections and build your whole um, group of supporters and you'll get your own fans. And, and don't expect it to happen overnight. This is a long-term process and, and you never know when it's gonna pay off. Um, I mean, George R. R. Martin, People talk about he's one of the wealthiest writers ever, but the guy has been around forever. I, I've known him and been reading his stuff since like 1971, and he wasn't unsuccessful. He won a lot of awards and he was uh, did quite well. But but this superstardom that he's in has come after 40 years of working his butt off. So um, just put in the time, and and there there is no. Um, if people keep saying, what's the shortcut to success? Or, well, if I knew that, that I wouldn't have spent 30 years doing it. So you try it. And if you have the, the talent and persistence and a few lucky breaks, it, it might work for you. Now, uh, earlier you were talking a little bit about how, like, to be an interesting person, you sort of have to live an interesting life. Like, if you can travel, travel and sort of get new stuff into your head. Um, how important do you think it is for authors to continue to read and otherwise indulge in literature as opposed to just producing it? Well, I don't want to be a hypocrite because the thing is, is I'm spending all my time reading so that when I, when I take a break, I just want to kick back and watch a movie or watch TV or something like that. Um, thank God for audiobooks, though, because when I'm driving or when I'm working out in the gym, I can be playing a book and I can still keep up on, on things. But I, I used to read a lot more than I do now. I remember it was my goal to read every year when like the Hugo Ballot came out or the Nebula Ballot. I was reading every one of those stories and every one of those novels. And, and I just, I don't have the time anymore for it. I'm, I'm not recommending that though. I, I think if you can read and you have the time, um, that that's a really important thing. Um, just because you, you study how other people did it. Now, it, it's like becoming a gynecologist. I mean, you're, it, erotica isn't quite so much fun if you're a gynecologist anymore because you look at the stuff all the, all the time. I, I can't just read and enjoy novels anymore because every time I'm reading, I'm analyzing the plot structure and how the scene was set up and how this thing was described. And, and oh boy, I could have done that better or they screwed that up. That they're, My whole joy of sitting back and reading a book um, is just, it's gone away because I it's just, I know all the sausage making process and, and I'm studying it as a professional now instead of as a reader. And if you can retain the joy of reading, um, please do because that's an important skill. And my real drawback is that I'm a slow reader. It'll take me a month or more to read a book. Um, I, I hate these people that can read a book two or three days cause I wish I could do that. Uh, it just doesn't happen though. Um, I, I would like to read more. I, I think it's good for an author to be well read, but I mean, I, it's not like I'm illiterate. I've read lots of books. So I, I, I spend so much of my energy working on my own craft that that's where my time goes. So I'll have to be the one to ask this here. Is your word fire press accepting, sub, accepting submissions? Cause I'm sure I'll be asked later on down the line. We'll probably ask. We, we generally say no always, and then somebody convinces us otherwise because they came up with this gigantic platform or, um, I mean, we just accepted two new short story collections by Alan Dean Foster. Well, it's Alan Dean Foster, so of course I'm going to accept his, his short story collections. Who has um, We've got books by, <laughs> yeah, 
Um, we published four of Frank Herbert's never before published novels. Well, like I'm going to turn that down. Uh, Jody Lynn Nye is, gives us books and, and Robert Lynn Asprin, who's, who's passed away, but his estate is having us reissue the uh, Fool's Company series, which are doing very well for us. Um, but like I was telling you about that author who approached us that wanted us to publish her book, but then she had no platform. Um, we get a lot of submissions from, uh, from new authors or indie authors. Um, and, and we look at them and sometimes um, you can't say no, but we're, we're closed, but you can maybe break down the door. And we, uh, I mean, that's just a self-defense mechanism. We're still just trying to get caught up with our backlist and, you know, we can publish four or five books a month, but if I do that, and we don't have any energy to promote them at all, then that nobody is served well. So we're, we're trying to find our balance there too. So the, the short answer is uh, we're not, not really open, but if, if you really think that you've got something that is impossible to refuse, then we can certainly look at it. All right, we had one last question pop up from Twitter here. Maureen asks, what are the best books to study to write science fiction well? All of my novels, of course, um, the selected story science fiction that, um, let's see. I loved, loved this book called Writing the Blockbuster Novel by Al Zuckerman. He was, the, he was Ken Follett's agent. It's a little bit dated now just because it was from 20 some years ago, but that book changed my life as a writer and a plotter because he, he basically um, said, if you wanna write a blockbuster novel, you, then you got to write a blockbuster novel. You can't just write your average novel and expect it to sell a million copies. And the the plot structure and advice that he did uh, was just just eye opening for me. It was an epiphany for me to read it. And I, I'm pretty sure that's available. It was a Writer's Digest book. I think it's it's his own publication now. Um, I myself have a, a a pretty good one. I think called World Building from Small Towns to Entire Universes. Um, one of one of my better skills is on world building. And so I've, I've given lectures and classes on it. And this is sort of a distillation of all of my, uh, the best stuff that I've learned. Um, David Farland has a book called Million Dollar Outlines, where he really works into plotting and plot structure. Uh, I like that a great deal. And it's very useful. Um, those are the ones that come to mind. I mean, I, I don't, spend a lot of time reading writing books like I said I don't have time to read the fiction either but um, I'm not talking you out of it I just don't personally have the time for myself all right great I will put those books in the show notes this is gonna be episode 194 for you guys that are listening and want to pop in later and get the links there and I guess just to wrap us up, Kevin, if I was a student in your program coming in today and I wanted to know, should I traditionally publish or should I self-publish? Uh, what kind of advice, now that you've done it all, <laughs> are, you, are you giving new writers these days? Or be a hybrid. Yeah. Well, hybrid is kind of what I, what I push at. I mean, the, the real, real problem with traditional publishing is the time. Uh, and if it's three years before they will respond to you and then a year or two years before they publish it and you're writing five books a year, well, you can see how that's, that's problematic. But on the other hand, traditional publishing, you don't want to minimize the things that they do for authors as far as the, the development of, developmental editor that they hire, the copy editors, the proofers, the art directors, the, the marketing departments. I mean, they, this is stuff that you have to do by yourself. Um, I, I would love to just be traditionally published if we were back in the 90s because that really worked. But I, I'm not having a crystal ball, but um, I'm kind of looking up at the sky and seeing this big asteroid coming and deciding whether I want to be a dinosaur or a mammal. And I, I think that as an author now, you really need to learn how publishing works and make the decision for yourself. There weren't any choices back in the 80s or 90s that you basically had one path you went to traditional publishing and now there are different different routes that you can go to but it requires you to become an expert in all these things that you you didn't used to have to know so 
buckle up and, and do your homework and, and drink a lot of coffee, I think. All right. Sounds like good advice. And um, could you wrap it up here? Tell us your, uh, you've got a story bundle coming up. You're, you've got a new podcast. You started this last year. Do you want to mention anything that uh, folks can go check out? Well, I guess ju just today, my selected stories, science fiction came out, uh, which is 19 really good stories that I've, I've compiled. And I really like that. Um, I just had a brand new novel called Uncharted, Lewis and Clark in Arcane America. That's in hardcover from Bain Books, and it's co-authored with Sarah Hoyt, been a friend of mine for a while. Um, uh, find me on Facebook, the official Kevin J. Anderson page, or on Twitter, it's the word the in my initials, KJA. Um, let's see. And on all those things, there are like signups for my readers group, and you get free stuff and everything. But um, I'm just, if you can't find me that I'm not doing something right because I should be easy to track down. Um, and I've got, let's see, next month I'll have the Selected Stories Fantasy volume out. And the month after that, Selected Stories Horror and Dark Fantasy. And then I have a new Dan Shamble collection out. And then I have the Selected, the second volume of Science Fiction Stories, Spine of the Dragon, the big fantasy that I was telling about. That comes out next June. I'm still... I'm still editing that. Um, oh, and I, I just sold a new thriller that's an audible original called Steak. It's a serial killer where the guy believes in vampires, so he's breaking into like the homes of people that work the night shift and driving a stake through the heart because he thinks they're vampires. And so he's the vampire killer, but he's the bad guy. And that will be an audible original. We haven't sold the print rights, and we're not allowed to until the audio comes out. So that's that's another new thing that... Uh, that whole market didn't exist before. So just, and that's what I'm doing today. Who knows what I'll do tomorrow? <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I've, I've seen some authors getting those audible deals and it's, it's very interesting how much uh, they seem to believe that audiobooks are really coming on strong and uh, willing to invest in, in having that exclusive first peek at something. So it's fun to watch. Well, and, and uh, I've got an adventure science fiction story bundle that launches the end of August, August 28th, and tried to get Lindsay in there, but she had a, books were all, were all taken up or something like that. But story bundles are, we didn't talk about those, but a humble bundle, story bundle, that's, that's a totally original thing from indie authors that everybody is sort of gangs together and cross promotes and, and sells a bunch of eBooks that way. It's a, uh, a market that horrifies traditional publishers so they don't know how to track things, but it, it brings a nice chunk of change for all the authors who participate. So we're still doing them. Absolutely. And I would do it. I'm just, I've been in one before. I've been in several of them. <laughs> so uh, they try not to do the same book. I think every more than every two years or so, but uh, yeah, I definitely will check it out. And I hope folks check out some of the stuff you mentioned at least. <laughs> and, uh, or at least follow you on Instagram to see what your cat is up to. Oh, come on. How can you, how can you not when you have a book title called Tastes Like Chicken? <laughs> yes. Well, it is a zombie private detective, so it's supposed to be goofy titles. There you go. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm glad to be back on after. after, after. Right. We appreciate you hanging out with us. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for joining us, Kevin. Have a great week. All right. So long, everybody. <laughs>